Aloha Kako. Uh, welcome and good evening. My name is James Eustis and I'm the president of the Waimea Community Association. Uh, thank you for joining us online tonight for our regular monthly Waimea Community Association town meeting. I encourage you to follow, like, and subscribe to the Waimea Community Association on our Facebook page, Instagram, and even up on YouTube. Uh, you may also find relevant information and resources on our website at waimeatown.org. We do strive to keep our accounts active and up to date. And at this point, I would like to recognize the WCA board members, our Vice President, Michael Donnelly, our Treasurer, Jeremy Madrid, our Secretary, Nancy Carr-Smith, and our Directors, Riley Smith, Lonnie olson Chong, David Greenwell, and Patty Cook. And on behalf of the Waimea Community Association Board, uh, we are grateful for the support shown by you, the community, to hold these virtual meetings during this time. Thank you all for your interest in joining us for our past meetings and for viewing and sharing our recordings. Uh, you are welcome to revisit these videos up on the WCA Facebook page or even up on our YouTube channel. The Waimea Community Association is a nonprofit organization that strives to promote open participation by all of the Waimea community, develop leadership, and support the smart growth of the region. If you'd like to support the work that we have done, help continue our effort in connecting with our community, you're more than welcome to donate and join as a member. If this is something that interests you and you would like to receive more information, please email us at Waimea Community Association at gmail.com or visit our website at waimeatown.org. And on our website, uh, you can find an option to contribute and join digitally. Uh, so you are welcome, or you are welcome to mail us a membership form that you can find on our website if you prefer. Your contributions and your membership allow us to reach out and connect with the community in this setting and support the work that the WCA has done over the past 60 years. Mahalo nui. And tonight, uh, as mentioned, and per our agenda, we'll be hearing some important updates that address community growth, concerns, and planning for the future. We'll begin this evening with a community policing update, and then we'll spend some time sharing some community, uh, some other community updates and announcements. And after spotlighting our July nonprofit of the month, uh, we will spend a little time hearing updates from the County Council. And for our main portion of tonight's agenda, we'll learn more about the looming threat of the two-line spittle bug. This evening, we are grateful to present you with a full and informative agenda and after we hear from these officials and representatives and organizations, we have allocated some time to share your questions with our presenters. We appreciate community members sending in their questions ahead of time, but we will also try and capture some of your live questions for this portion. So please use the Facebook chat to pose your live questions and we'll do our best to share them with our, with our presenters and guests this evening. And thank you to the WCA board members, Michael Donnelly and Nancy Carr-Smith for joining me this evening and presenting these questions. All right, so at this time, I would first like to welcome back uh, Captain Evangelista and Community Policing Officer Chandler Nacino for a few community policing updates. Uh, welcome, Captain, Officer, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, so afternoon everybody. I'm just gonna go over um, some of our uh, crime statistics that we had for the uh, month of June. So without going into the numbers too deep, uh, we uh, we noticed the reduction in uh, burglaries, um, criminal property damage, assault, and uh, uh, vehicle break-ins. We did notice an increase in uh, theft cases and our um, auto theft remained the same. So some of the things we um, have been noticing an uptick in as far as the uh, theft goes, we have been noticing a few more um, scams or people falling a uh, victim to the scams. So what we do, we do recommend is if there is any question about um, any of these scams or something that might seem fishy, if they're asking for gift cards or you to wire them money, or if they're sending you checks for more than uh, what you're um, requesting as payment, we do ask that you call the non-emergency line and at least ask to uh, speak to an officer 
Um, that way they can go over it with you and help you determine if it is in fact some sort of a scam. Um, one of the other things we have noticed is that there has been um, some mail theft that has been occurring. Uh, a lot of the mail theft um, goes undetected. A lot of people just maybe think it possibly just got lost or they just weren't expecting something in the mail. And we usually only find out about it uh, when we interact with the uh, individuals who uh, aren't authorized to possess the mail or weren't given permission to have the mail. So uh, one of the things we are recommending for that is if possible to um, drop off your outgoing mail to the uh, post office. That way you know that it is secure and going out and to possibly have a, a mailbox uh, with some sort of lock on it for your um, incoming mail. Yeah, those are all excellent suggestions. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to add in something um, beyond the, the property crime angle. So, you know, we, we did have thefts and a few of them were from scams. Um, on, a, on a more positive note, um, you know, our, our violent crimes had no increase and, and in fact had decreases. So we had uh, zero reported assaults in the month of June, um, which is pretty awesome for our district, our size. Um, we hope that trend keeps going. And um, we, we didn't have any robberies reported either. So those are great. Um, and then as far as uh, what Officer Nasino was saying about, uh, you know, just uh, the not, not falling victim to a scam, you know, trust your gut. We, we urge everybody to trust your gut. Um, if it feels wrong or sounds wrong, um, there's nothing wrong with asking some more questions, even of the person that, that you may be trying to deal with at the time. Uh, feel them out, ask them some more questions. And if you get a funny feeling about it, don't send any money. Um, and, and share with everybody you know, especially our kupuna, who uh, tend to take things at face value and trust everybody. Let's, let's encourage them to be a little bit more, um, not suspicious, but skeptical. And, uh, and, and ask, ask more questions before sending money. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Captain, and thank you, Officer Nacino. Uh, just a quick question that kind of came in. You know, we've had some changes with um, at the county level with animal control. Could you maybe talk about that for for a moment, if you could? Um, so, it was in the newspaper that the uh, county has canceled the contract with Hawaii Rainbow Rangers. Um, in fact, th there were there were a lot of good quotes from our chief in that article. But the, the bottom line was he wanted to express that uh, uh, I, although rumors run rampant about why, uh, basically the contract is being uh, terminated because the, the services that, that, that were needed in the contract aren't being met. Um, so in the meantime, the county will be looking for a new vendor. And uh, I believe that um, Hawaii Rainbow Rangers and other organizations have been asked to sort of help out in the interim. And um, they've been getting some, some assistance through those organizations. I, I believe Hawaii Island Humane Society has also jumped on board to, to help out uh, until we can get a new contract in place with a new vendor. Thank you, Captain. And I'm sure the council will probably add some more of this as well, but appreciate your thoughts on that. And, uh and your response to this and your service to the community. So thank you, Captain Officer Nacino. Appreciate your time this evening. Anything else, Officer Nacino, you wanted to say this evening? No, no, we just, uh, you know, what? there's been an uptick in crime across the nation and our district seems to be doing very well. So it's a, it's a good thing to have. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Officer Nacino. Captain, always a pleasure. And thank you for your service. Appreciate your support of the community. Mahalo. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about our annual Christmas parade. So I'd like to welcome one of our WCA board members and the Waimea Christmas Parade co-chair, Lonnie Olson Chung, to share with us some news about our annual Twilight Christmas Parade. Lonnie, welcome. Mahalo. 
Aloha and good evening. First of all, I would like to say mahalo to everyone in our community, our island, and the many folks from our neighbor islands and even on the mainland who have been calling me and asking me for an update on our parade. You may be surprised to know that many people plan their vacations around our parade. So you see our parade is famous, but no matter how famous we are, we do not make up our own rules. I wish we could say that we have the green light to move forward with the planning of our 60th parade, but we don't. We didn't ask to be in this situation, but we are. I am optimistic, however, and I believe that if we, that means all of us, abide by the guidelines that are set before us, and if we continue to take the necessary precautions on staying safe, staying healthy, staying aware of our surroundings, and ensure that we are diligent in keeping our community, our island, and our state safe, so that one day we will be able to say, we got the green light and our Christmas parade is on. But for now, save the date, Saturday, December 4th. And as we continue to work with our mayor and his staff and do our part, we just may be attending our parade. I'm certain that with the route change, we will have the capability of spreading out more, we will be able to be more aware of our neighbors and respect each other's boundaries. We're grateful that we are at a yellow light instead of a red light as of today. And I firmly believe that we will get to the point of getting a green light and our 60th Waimea Community Christmas Twilight Parade will become a reality. Mahalo for your time and your ongoing support. Aloha. Mahalo Lani, Aloha. thank you so much. And you know, along, along that similar line, we wanted to uh, really talk about these larger public events across the county here. And so we, we brought in, we're grateful to have uh, Mr. Doug Adams, who's the director of the County of Hawaii Research and Development Department. So Mr. Adams, thanks for joining us, uh, just to talk a little bit about some of these large, large events and large community events. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, James, appreciate the opportunity. Um, and I appreciate the uh, patience that uh, your parade committee um, has with the the decision-making that we're trying to make. We, we have had the opportunity um, with Civil Defense, Talmadge Magno Administrative Civil Defense, and with our department helping out in um, taking a look at the event requests that have been coming in and making sure, frankly, that um, as the restrictions have been um, getting less and less res uh, restrictive, uh, but there's still this requirement for social gathering, there's still this requirement for the um, the masking and the sanitation and, and uh, social distancing that are part of those gatherings. And so we take a look at all of these requests as they come in, make sure that they're um, abiding by uh, the requirements that the, that the governor and his emergency proclamations have been putting in. Uh, and so, for example, I would just mention um, uh, regarding the, all the all parades at the moment, um, and I, I should mention, I, I'm actually involved in a couple of parades and have been for a number of years here in, the, uh, in East Hawaii. And so this, this has some impact on um, uh, what we're doing um, as well. Uh, we, are, we, we have to pay attention to um, the crowd and uh, crowd control associated with this. We're, we're still not necessarily out of the woods. And so that is part of the reason why we are um, just withholding at the moment um, full um, approval of these parades. Um, I think that as we move forward, we're likely to, we're, we're watching the, the vaccination rates as well as anyone. We're watching the active cases rates as well as anyone. Um, and we're certainly hopeful that um, we can um, get to the 70% that would allow the governor just to say um, restrictions are gone, uh, but we're not quite there yet. And so we're, we're uh, we're having to just use the yellow light kind of uh, idea uh, uh, regarding these decisions. We're paying attention to the timing. Um, we understand that the planning, what the mayor has done is said, yes, please plan. Um, and I understand also the obligations that, that need to be placed um, uh, on, you know, whether it's vendors or uh, police permits or what have you. And so I'm aware of those things and the timelines associated in prepping for this. So. We're going to try and um, make these decisions in a timely manner, but we're not yet at that point where we can do it. Mahalo, Director. I appreciate your knowledge on that and really your patience with the community. And so how does this, and a kind of a question about some of the other upcoming events that we have on island that affect, um, kind of we have on a regular basis. For example, we have our 
our international triathlons? How do, how do those play into this as well? Right. So as a matter of fact, I just had a meeting with um, the Ironman um, uh, team, and we're going to be talking about what has to happen, particularly during that week. Um, we were very um, happy to see and grateful to see actually the community support for the Honu Triathlon, um, the half Ironman that occurred at uh, the, um, the Fairmont Orchid um, at the beginning of June, beginning of uh, last month. That went um, extremely well. They had uh, shown us what their plan was um, to manage that within the, um, the restrictions that um, were placed on. Um, they did that. We had uh, no cluster. We also didn't have much of an audience. Um, so as we take a look at October, we understand that there will be times, um, whether it's their parade or whether it's at the finish line, where there will be a lot of people. And so we're, we're talking about what that looks like. We're hopeful that um, we can just say we're good to go, um, but we are going to be paying attention to that kind of event uh, to make sure that we don't have, um, that we don't revert back. Um, as we all know, it's been in the papers. It's not a surprise. Uh, the Delta variant is a concern and making sure that we don't necessarily fall back um, after we've um, done a pretty good job um, with a few clusters here and there. We've done a pretty good job in keeping our active cases low, making sure that we don't overwhelm our hospitals because we just don't have a lot of ICU beds on the island. Uh, so we've done that. Um, and so we're gonna be taking a look at these events on a case by case basis. Uh, and, and to the extent that we can work through some of the issues, I, I have to say um, that the event coordinators um, have been terrific. They understand um, as well as anyone um, what, what's being asked for here and uh, we've been working collaboratively with them uh, to try and make sure that the event can be held, but in a safe um, COVID-19 protocol manner. Thank you, Director. And, and that kind of goes along with the Mary Monarch as well. Uh, we know they have that virtual aspect to it, I believe, but there's still you would still have some attendance and, and visitation and kind of a spectatorship for that sort of event. As it turned out, the, that was um, extremely well uh, developed um, with the uh, Mary Monarch team and the uh, Department of Parks and Recreation um, as overseen by the mayor's office. Uh, they really worked together to develop these bubbles, if you will, these pods for the different halal. Um, of course, they have already done their, they've already had their um, uh, competition and you can start watching it tonight. Probably it will be on after this. Um, the, uh, and so that whole process was held without um, any audience members uh, this year, but the Halals were able to um, compete. They were able to do their artistry and we'll all be the beneficiary of that because we'll be able to watch it at least on TV. So that whole setup, the whole teamwork set of that, um, everybody had to agree if they were gonna be either um, part of the production team or the safety team or in a Halal, they had to agree to all of the requirements, which included quarantining prior to um, the competition. Uh, and, and of course, all the cleaning and all those kinds of things that had to take part. But they did it. And, um, and from what I can tell, um, the, the uh, Mary Monarch um, coordinators are very, very happy with the, uh, with the result. And I guess we'll get a chance to see it over the next three nights. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Director. Appreciate your time and join us this evening and kind of sharing your Manao about about these events and where the mayor is on, on all these things um, and really creating safe communities here for us. So mahalo and thank you to you and your team. Thanks, James. I, I, I really appreciate your team and uh, the, the Waimea Community, Community Association. You know, you all do just a wonderful job making sure that you keep your community um, present and uh, in an understanding manner of what's happening out there. Uh, and so on a monthly basis, I know that uh, your community appreciates what you all are doing. I'm prepared to answer any questions if there are any that um, that popped up and I'll, I'll stay on for a little while. Thank you, Director, I appreciate that. Um, so I, at this point we're gonna move on to uh, a few there that kind of came out on the fly. So I appreciate you jumping right on those. Um, and kind of on the same, the same realm, uh, we're gonna be talking and we're grateful to have uh, Kathy Marquette, who's an APRN and a medical director at Hamakua Kohala Health, to kind of share some other community updates and 
happenings with COVID-19. Um, so Kathy, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, the floor is yours. Great. Um, nice to be here. It's a, a forum that um, I really appreciate being invited to. Uh, one of my passions these days um, is COVID-19 vaccination. Um, you know, I'm asked on a daily basis by adults and especially parents if they should be vaccinated and if they think their children should be vaccinated. And emphatically, the answer is yes. Um, even though the vaccine rolled out quickly uh, to stop death and the misery of COVID-19 illness, no quality steps were skipped or skimped on. Um, so the vaccine is very safe. Um, it approved right now for um, uh, everyone 12 and older. Um, as of today, um, about 59% of our 12 and older population has been vaccinated. Um, about 71% have initiated vaccination. That means that they may have had one vaccination and has, have not completed their full two uh, vaccination cycles. Um, I'm happy to report that of um, our population on this island of 75 and above, 88% of those have been vaccinated, which is awesome. Um, the concerning thing is our 12 to 17 year olds, we're still sitting at about 37%. Um, it's estimated that the population, that group of population is about 14,000. So we still have some work to do in getting those, um, those folks vaccinated. Um, I'm expecting right now, Pfizer vaccine is the only vaccine approved for the 12 to 17 year old group. Um, I'm expecting any day that the Moderna vaccine will also be approved. Um, the studies um, look wonderful. Um, and um, there's lots of vac vaccines on island right now. And in our community, um, Hamakua Kohala Health is giving vaccinations. North Hawaii Community Hospital is giving vaccinations. Uh, KTA Pharmacy is giving vaccinations. Um, so it is readily available and everyone um, uh, has vaccines in their refrigerators or freezers. So I encourage everyone you know to go out and, um, and sign up for a vaccination. Um, all of the patients who are currently hospitalized or who have recently died are patients or are people who have not been vaccinated. So in the hospitalizations that we're seeing, um, none of those folks had been um, uh, vaccinated. Um, most important is, you know, these um, individuals at high risk, Unvaccinated individuals are at high risk of um, being, infect being infected by the more contagious um, Delta variant. Um, and these are rapidly spreading variants. And um, we need to realize that even though you as an individual might not get um, terribly sick or die from COVID, you, you are at risk at spreading it to somebody who is at risk. And if you, vac if you um, contaminate them, then they um, run the risk, you run the risk of spreading to other people who may be at risk for, um, um, for deadly disease or the misery of illness. Um, like somebody else, like somebody who cannot be vaccinated or like a child in your family, because we are not, in, right now, we're not immunizing those um, zero to 12. And so those are the most vulnerable in our population right now. Over 350 children have died in the US of COVID and thousands have been hospitalized. So even though they are, they fare better than um, our elderly Kapuna in um, when they get COVID, they still are not out of um, danger. Um, so we need to, um, get vaccinated to stop the spread. If we want our life, our healthy lifestyles for our children, uh, if we want them to go back to school safely, the rest of us who 
have the opportunity to get vaccinated need to get vaccinated. And it's not for us as individuals, it's for our families, it's for our um, community. Um, so, you know, chat up the folks that you know that are vaccine hesitant um, and, you know, do it for the team. Um, because this really isn't about an individual enterprise. It's about us all working together um, to make our community safer. Um, some good news um, about COVID vaccination is that pregnant and lactating mothers um, we're finding can protect, protect uh, can pass protective immunity um, onto their own born babies and through breast milk. Looks like vaccines have a longer protection than we first thought. We may not be getting boosters in the fall. So, and it looks like by the end of the year, um, we'll be vaccinating those six months and above. So go out and get your vaccination. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kathy. I really appreciate your time and being here and kind of sharing these updates and kind of giving the statistics there and really um, supporting this endeavor that we're all going through. I, I do have another announcement we'll get to in a little bit about some of the vac vaccination clinics that are happening in the community. And I'll pop that up on the screen here soon. Um, and as we kind of get into those community announcements, I'd, I'd first like to uh, welcome Lori Farron to share with us an upcoming opportunity that may help you or someone you know in assisting employment outreach and resume guidance. You know, during this time, people are transitioning work uh, or out of work or trying to find places of work. So this is, could be an opportunity for you or someone you know to really to jump on. So Lori, uh, the floor is yours and I can share up on the screen here as well. Thanks, James. Um, and thanks to Patty for connecting me and uh, getting me on the agenda tonight. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, as James mentioned, we have a employment workshop that's going to be at Tutu's house. It is uh, employment and resume development. There is no charge for the workshop. Uh, the first one is scheduled for Tuesday, July 13th, and it starts at 2.30 and I'll go until four. And depending upon the level of interest, if we have a lot of people that are interested and we, uh, we are following COVID restrictions, so it's a very small gathering, uh, there is a limit of eight. So if there's a lot of people that are interested, please go ahead and call. And that way we can make sure that uh, Tutu's House is very open to keeping this um, um, an ongoing schedule. And we can make sure that everybody who wants the information is able to um, participate in the workshop. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I've worked at various social service agencies and government programs here in Hawaii and on the mainland in King County, Washington. I've done a lot of job readiness trainings and the ones that I've done um, for the different organizations are you know, pretty in depth. And what we're doing here with this workshop is providing, it's an hour and a half. So we cover the topics that are most um, important for the folks who attend to cover. Um, so uh, a lot of folks, they just either they're changing careers or they're just kind of reluctant to get out there. And this information is there to help them feel like they're up to date on the best, best methods that are used in getting a job, that they have the tools to help the experience be less stressful and hopefully more effective. And the workshop's topics are uh, job search strategies, tips for completing a job application, information on developing a resume and a cover letter, and exercises that can help folks who are a little bit more nervous about the job interview process so that they feel a little bit more calm, a little bit more focused in the job interview. Um, like I said, the material that I cover in this workshop is a much higher level overview. So the folks who attend will let me know what subjects they really wanna focus on. And if it continues to be an ongoing workshop, then maybe we'll break it down and have different topics covered at different workshops throughout you know, the month. So we need feedback and we need to have folks who are interested, let Tutu's House know that, that they'd like to attend. So they need to call the number that's on the flyer, which is uh, 885-6777. And also, if you know of an agency that serves folks who might be interested 
in coming to the workshop and they need one of these flyers that James has put up on the, um, on the screen here, um, please, you can either contact Tutu's house and they have, um, they can make sure that you get a flyer that you can post. Um, I think James and Patty also have a copy of the flyer. So might be able to, that might be an easier way to get it. Um, and again, this is a, a very high end view um, of all, all of these topics, but it really is for the folks who, who attend to decide you know, what we're gonna focus on. So if there are folks who are out there who are looking to do uh, maybe change industries that they've been working in and they need to figure out how to, to and they wanna focus on making their resume fit the new type of job, this really is the kind of workshop that that's what we can focus on. Um, and if there are any questions or any concerns, people want to contact me directly. I'm happy to talk to you about it. If you have any questions, um, my number, my phone number is 854-9629. And if anybody has any questions here tonight that they'd like answered, if we have a couple seconds, we can, I can answer any questions. Thanks, Lori. I'll, I'll jump in if there's, if something pops up to be directed towards you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, uh, I've got a couple of other announcements here as well, kind of community related. Let's see, so thanks, thank you, Lori, on that announcement on uh, the resume workshop there and guiding people to improve their, improve their presentability and reach out to their employer, potential employers. So thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna put a couple of things up on the screen here. So first of all, tomorrow, let's see, I'll put the right one up here. So you should be able to see that. So tomorrow will be, there'll be a food basket Ohana drop starting at uh, 10 a.m. at the Spencer Kalani Shuri Waimea District Park. This is uh, tomorrow, Friday, July 2nd. So masks a must please, right? So as always. Um, and as was the case a year ago, Hawaii Food Basket has partnered with Parker Ranch to supplement the food assistance with local grass-fed beef. So mahalo to Hawaii Food Baskets and Parker Ranch for your continued support of our families and our communities during this time. I think I have, let's see if I have another image of that, but there are a couple of press releases that went out about that. Uh, so if that interests you at all, there's uh, the event there tomorrow at the, at the Waimea District Park. All right, and then next up, we have a, a vac vaccination and a vaccine clinic, a pop-up clinic here in Waimea. And I'll make sure I'll have the right one popping up here. All right, so this is happening at the Kamola Hongwanji. Uh, this is on Saturday from 9.30 to 3.30. So if you're out and about on Saturday and you're looking for an opportunity to get a, receive a vac vaccination or a vaccine, um, you can just stop by the Kamal Hongwanji. Uh, so you can spread the word about this. And the, there are a couple of incentives too. So if you, if you go in there and you get a, a vaccine, you don't need, there's no charge, no appointment. It's a walk-in clinic. Uh, this is really for everyone 18 and over because it's still the Moderna and Johnson Johnson vaccines, which haven't been approved for that younger age group yet. But there are some incentives. You might be able to, uh, there's a grand prize drawing for a two nights uh, Red Ohana vacation rental and also a Kohala Canopy Adventure with, with Kohala Zipline. So there are a couple of prizes and opportunities for those that, that go and get a vaccine this Saturday in Waimea at the Hongwanji there. So that should be up on the screen there for you to see some other incentives, gift cards and whatnot. So it should encourage you and other family members to go out and um, participate. Let's see, we also have uh, I want to make sure I have the right one up here, but there are a couple other things happening this weekend with the holiday weekend. Um, and I'll make sure I have the right one up here. Okay. So this one is kind of a, you know, part of the holiday weekend here. Just a reminder that YPO Valley Road is going to be closed to non-residents over the holiday weekend. 
Um, this is just to protect the residents in the valley there during this time. And uh, there'll be some special duty officers and rangers that are kind of scheduled there at the top of the road. So please be aware of that uh, during this holiday weekend. Um, and then also there, you know, there are also a couple upcoming events and activities in the community happen this weekend. It's a, like I said, it's a holiday weekend. Uh, so there are upcoming shows, including the theater. Uh, there's some astronomy talks being hosted by Keck later on this month. Uh, let's see, I have one of their example. So here's the upcoming Keck astronomy talk on cosmic fireworks, if this interests you. This is a virtual event. So this is a little bit later this month on, on July 20th. Um, we also have, I don't have it there, let's see. Um, there's also with the, you should be able to see that. So this is with uh, the South Wallet Coastal Partnership. If you're interested in any of the environmental stewardship projects that are happening in the community here and across the district, these are a couple of, uh, uh, live stream talks about specific uh, specific topics here. So the one that we just missed was in June about our water here. The next is uh, healing Kwai Hai from Malka to Makai, restoring watersheds and preventing erosion. So these are some upcoming summer speaker series that the Koala, South Koala Coastal Partnership is putting on. I think that's really all it for, for my little announcements there. I know there are a lot of other things going on and we do try and put them up on our Facebook page and website. And if you're looking for uh, a venue to share some of these events, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, you know, and it is the holiday weekend. So I want everyone to be safe out there for the holiday weekend uh, with family and friends. Please be safe and mindful. And then of course, we wanna thank you as Wyoming Community Association. You know, thank you our viewers and fellow community members for continuing to do your part in preventing the spread of COVID-19. By of course, wearing masks, uh, practicing good physical distancing, avoiding large gatherings and helping to maintain this low rate of infection in our communities. Uh, and please continue to do your part for the health and safety of our community and our loved ones. And this is our Kuliano. So please consider being vaccinated. Uh, mahalo nui. All right, so at, and at this time, um, I'd like to welcome in Patty Cook for the month of July. The Waimea Community Association will be spotlighting Annunciation Food Pantry as our nonprofit of the month. And to help uh, recognize a particular community hero, I'd like to welcome in Patty to say a few words about our July nonprofit and the work that's been carried out this year, uh, not to mention the heavy lifting done for some of our summer programs here. So mahalo, Patty. I'll make sure you're unmuted there, sorry. Does that work there for you, Patty? Sorry, you're still muted, Patty. Let's see. I'll unmute myself, that might work better. <laughs> Good evening. I'm actually here um, wearing the hat for the Community Association Board. We were talking about the pandemic and of course the fact it's not over yet, but we also couldn't help but acknowledge the fact that we've been very fortunate as a community um, because of the low virus load, but also because so many organizations, our churches and businesses and nonprofits and farmers and ranchers, just so many people, including individual citizens, have stepped forward to help, most notably, to prevent hunger. Few communities have such generous response, but it didn't just happen. It's a reflection of the amazing volunteers willing to put themselves at risk and willing to do some heavy lifting. We think these volunteers are heroes and wanted to thank them for doing what it takes, whether that's planning and shopping and hauling and carrying and unloading and packing and distributing boxes of food or preparing from scratch, me from scratch meals weekly for more than 60 weeks. With deep respect to all of Waimea's food programs and volunteers, tonight we honor Miley Lincoln, who last June volunteered to lead the Annunciation Community Food Pantry, which is a free food distribution program that had been in our community for nearly 15 years. Initially, it was headed by Ann Lum for years and her team who distributed about 35 or 40 boxes of food a week with most of the funding coming from the congregation. Then bam, COVID hit and suddenly they were faced with demand for 160 to 175 boxes each week. And it was costing more than $12,000 a month. 
concurrently, many of the church congregation were laid off, so unable to contribute to, the, to fund the food. So there was serious conversation about shutting down the food pantry because it was costing far more than the church could carry. So Miley and several others stepped up. They reorganized the pantry, partnered with the food basket, reached out to find new funding partners and recruited more volunteers. It's a huge undertaking each week, but Miley's one of those quiet but effective community friends who doesn't know the words no can. She can always, she always can do it and get others to help her. And as if distributing food boxes to 175 weekly for the past 60 weeks isn't enough, Miley and her crew recently said yes to a new seven week Cow Cow for Keiki summer distribution program coordinated by Waimea Resilience Hub and Vibrant Hawaii. It's terrific for the Waimea children, but it's a huge undertaking. The point being, there are dozens of volunteer heroes right here in our community helping to feed people, and we appreciate every single one of them. By saluting Miley this evening, we're really saying thank you to all who have voluntarily helped with the heavy lifting of feeding our community safely for the past 60 weeks. I've already said too much. Let me introduce tonight's spotlight. Here's Miley Lincoln. Most of you already know her, who runs the Annunciation Food Pantry. Thank you, Miley. Thank you, James. Aloha, everybody. Thank you so much, Patty, for that great introduction. Um, first of all, we just want to thank everyone for supporting us. Um, to get us through this pandemic. Like you said, we all never thought that we would go through something like this. And of course, it takes the resilience of a community. Um, it takes a village to get something going and to continue it. So thank you to everyone that has supported us. As Patty mentioned, you know, we started about 15 years ago and we started out of the garage of one of our congregation members, which was Mimi. And then we went on to having our food pantry at the church um, through Ann Lam, who's been there for over 10 years and all of her volunteers. And last year, July, I was contacted to say, we're in the situation where we don't think we can continue this pantry. We are spending way more than we can sustain. And, you know, we're looking for a different way out. And of course I was out of work like most of the people here and truly thought that this is my opportunity to step in and to do something. I made it very clear that, you know, when I do go back to work, this is gonna be something that everybody can take over. We wanna try and make it sustainable because there is gonna be a point that I do need to leave and go back to work. So I've been at work for six months now. Um, the pantry has a multitude of volunteers that keep it going. It takes a lot to do um, the food distributions. And like Patty said, we have just launched on with the Cow Cow for Keiki, which is a seven week program. And we are personally um, providing 203 meals from our distribution site and New Hope is doing 97 kids. So we are doing 300 kids right in Waimea. Um, this is along with others in Kailapa, Waikoloa, Honaka'a, Pa'awilo, Hilo, Na'alehu, and Ka'u. So this has been um, a big undertaking that we've been doing as well. And we are super excited to be providing some meals for our kids here. So just going back to our community food pantry, we really wanted to thank a lot of people that stepped up. You know, our first and foremost, we wanted to pivot and find new funding for us. So we did have to go and look for some grants and some awards. And, you know, we want to thank, thank Diane Chadwick at Hawaii Community Foundation, um, Kate Bell, Councilman Tim Richards, who helped us the Atherton Grant, um, Richard Smart Fund. So many people out there that were willing to help us in this time of need when we didn't know what we were going to do, but we did know that we needed to provide something out there. The second pivot that we needed to do was we needed to find a partnership because it wasn't feasible and sustainable for us to continue to be buying food. So our first partnership was with the food basket. And so we'd like to thank Kristen and Marshall and Sarah, Dwayne, David, Terry, everybody at the food basket that has been so welcoming and has allowed us to partner with them to provide uh, more food 
along from food from the USDA as well to provide to our community. Once we got all of that set up, then we knew that we couldn't keep giving just shelf stable food. These people out here were not getting paid from unemployment. They didn't have jobs. We needed to pivot again and not only have shelf stable food, but we needed to bring in some fresh produce was our first thought. And so we went ahead and we got some partnerships. Um, we partnered with Bridges. Um, Keck jumped on board with Laurie Edmondson. They were so nice and gracious to um, have us as part of their family's first program. We partnered with HPA School and Farmer Willie, who comes every single week, um, Kukua Harvest, Kohala Gleaning Group. We were able to get some grants. We're currently partnering with the Full Calabash Fund from the Kohala Center, which is allowing us to purchase um, produce from local farmers. So Farmers that have partnered with us include Hirabara, Honopua, Mother Nature's Miracle, JA Farms, Kawamata, um, Papayas from Pahoa, um, and more. So we are extremely grateful and thankful for everybody that has been jumping on this bandwagon. So once we pivoted from shelf stable, we decided on the produce, then we wanted to add in some protein. So that was our next pivot. And we were able to partner with Hawaii Big Island Beef Producers um, through Deacon Kiyoki Wood. He was able to get us a collaboration there. So that was awesome. Um, we have been collaborating. Our next collaboration is a Double D Ranch that's going to be coming up in a couple of weeks. So that has been the major pivots of our food pantry in that we're no longer just doing the shelf stable food, but we offer produce as well as fresh protein weekly to all of the people that come through the line. We also at one point was the recipient of Hope Services food boxes that included fresh milk, fresh box, boxes of protein and produce for 12 weeks. So all of these partnerships um, honestly has been what has made us successful and sustainable and resilient in this community. So we really wanted to thank everyone that has partnered with us. And um, it's truly a testament to the community and everybody around us that has helped us to get where we're at. Um, I think you saw a picture just a few minutes ago. We also wanted to let everybody know that we do provide dog food and cat food weekly. Um, we had partnered with Cares Hawaii before. We do have other families that have come in and supported us as well. So we did want to, um, you know, I have a soft spot, spot for our pet and furry friends. So we decided to add that in. And we are just super grateful for everyone. Other community partners that have jumped in is, you know, um, Parker School, HPA, uh, Waimea Country School, Canada France Hawaii Telescopes, um, Pohakuloa, the Boy Scouts, and even just the surrounding community with Laurie Ainsley and Kokua Christian Ministries, Rhonda Bell with Big Island Giving Tree, Sue Dela Cruz at St. James, and Lee Rivera from Sacred Heart. It really is a hui that helps us to be where we're at today. And of course, our continued faithful parishioners that continue to support us um, throughout all of this. And most importantly, you know, always in behind the scenes is our ad hoc committee, which is Patty Cook, um, Jerry Giffen, Emily Hoover, her husband, Mike Hoover, and previously Linda Lewandowski, who is, I mean, countless hours of just brainstorming, um, you know, volunteering, trying to make sure that we get everything up to par. So mahalo, mahalo, mahalo to everybody that has helped us to be where we are at. Thank you so much, Miley. Really appreciate all the work that you and your volunteers have done. Um, I know the Marines have also joined you from PTA recently too. Um, so thank you for all you know the collaborative effort that you're doing with our community members to support our families and our community here. Thank you for your leadership at Annunciation. Um, it, you've done an amazing job there. So thank you so much with this Keiki, uh, Cal Cal for Keiki program too. That's probably been a big, big part of your plate recently as well. So thank you so much, Miley. And it's wonderful to have you on the call this evening and sharing all the work that you're doing in the community. Thank Mahalo. you so much. Amazing work. Thank you, Miley. 
Um, all right. So please support, please continue to support Annunciation Food Pantry. Um, you know, Miley shared a lot of key aspects there that the, that the work they're doing in the community. There are a lot of other food distributors in the community as well. Um, and we, they all need support. They all need volunteers um, and, and Koku in other ways. So please consider helping when you can. Um, they do wonders for our community. So thank you once again. All right. Um, at this point, I'd like to welcome our council member, Tim Richards, into the call to kind of share with us some updates on the council side. Councilor, are you, are you with us right now? You're welcome to I jump am. on. All right. Welcome. All right. Well, th first of all, thanks again so much for <clears throat> my Mayor Community Association for the invite to have a quick chat. And uh, I'm going to start with by also thanking Miley Lincoln. And I have worked with her on several different levels. Patty Cook said, Tim, you're going to like her. No, that's not true. I love this woman. Her organizational skills and able to get things done is terrific. So Miley, well done. And thank you so much for what you have done. Um, Moving on to some of the things around, I also want to echo some of the comments that have been made about vaccinations. Um, I too have colleagues and friends that <clears throat> are tied into the national health care system uh, as advisors and all. And the comments that were made concerning COVID-19 COVID and the variant, right now, essentially, the only people that we're losing are the non-vaccinates. And so more than ever, it's so important to encourage everybody to vaccinate. We're, you know, we're approaching 60% right now. And I like those numbers about 65% uh, with the um, at least first vaccination. We're getting close to the 70%. And you know, everybody knows I'm a herd health guy. And this is herd health management, except on the human side. We've got to get that critical mass vaccinated so we can prevent the disease. And if it's not just for you, it's for those that can't be vaccinated. So please encourage everyone to vaccinate. Great comments on that. Um, other thing I wanna to touch on right now is mass transit. And this has been a recurrent theme in this um, forum time and time and time again. Uh, as many people know, the director is on administrative leave right now. And there is a new director, a man named John Ando, who just recently started, I think it's this week, and Doug, you can probably weigh in on that. Uh, he's just getting his feet wet, but we're starting to get things going. We need mass transit, we meet, need mass transit badly. We have a workforce on the east side that needs to get to work on the west side. And so we need that bus system to transport the, those people to their workstations. And uh, I know they're working on that right now. Stay tuned because I expect a lot of things gonna be changing coming up very shortly. Another thing I wanted to touch on was um, this week and um, our police force did touch on that questions to the captain uh, about the Rainbow Rangers and the animal enforcement, the animal um, control and what's going on with that. Uh, a lot of misinformation in social media and the mayor did a great job as did the police chief yesterday in highlighting the fact that this concept, we're going to be having a great number of euthanasias as we're shifting from the Rainbow Rangers over to, uh, initially, it's going to be county oversight on the animal control. Absolutely false. Absolutely false. And I can speak with authority on that. Um, I was asked to step in as a veterinarian, and I went to and toured the Kona facility as well as the Waimea facility, and then another vet veterinarian went to the Hilo facility. This is very common when county contracts are ending, that an assessment is done. A little bit different because this also had animals that need to be assessed. I can say with, with complete authority that the situation in the Kona facility, no animals were in critical need of emergency medical care. There were some things that needed to be attended to, but things were okay. Uh, and so I was happy to see that the the Transmission of information was also forthcoming. It was actually pretty smooth as far as the It was handled quite well between the police department and the newly hired administrator for the animal control portion of this for the county. I then went on to the Waimea shelter 
again with the group and the YMAS shelter, I, I have to say that was outstanding. They have done a really good job managing that facility. So I was pleased to see the, the management of that facility. Um, again, no health concerns with the animals, but there are some management concerns coming forward. So again, I wanted to highlight the fact that this is very methodical, very easy turnover, and the uh, administration as well as the police chief did a great job in highlighting what exactly what was going on there. Um, you know, James, we can touch on some other things, but I don't know, I jumped on some three or four topics real quick. I don't know if there's questions or how you wanna handle this. Uh, you go for it, Councillor. You got about ten minutes or so, so please uh, touch on anything you'd like to. If I have <laughs> questions, I'll I'll jump on in. Okay, sounds good. Um, adding on to that, as everyone stated, and and Doug did a great job, Doug Adams, um, describing us opening up and reopening up. I don't think anybody could uh, predict how quickly the tourism started coming back, and that's the good news meaning we're starting to see the churning in our, our economy. And everyone on this call, I'm sure has heard me talk about, we can't help our community unless we have the resources, financial resources that comes with the economy. That's the good side. The downside is this, as we are coming forth with the opening up of the economy, we're starting, we're stumbling a little bit as we don't have enough employees back at work as of yet and managing some of the concerns that have been highlighted. Uh, Tourism is, it's a two-edged sword. It's great for the economy, but we have to manage that well. And some of those things, we are starting to take steps going forward. Uh, it was highlighted that the YPO Valley will be shut down over the holiday weekend. I think that's appropriate because again, we have to be mindful and respectful of the people that live here as well. We've had this conversation before, but on the other side of the valleys, Polaloo Valley, uh, we see far more use of that valley than we ever have before. And the question is how are you going to manage it? The bigger question, this is something that Doug Adams and his research and development department is working on. They have some funding in their department uh, as it pertains to tourism, but a misunderstanding of that is that funding at this point is going to be used for managing and creating plans to better manage our tourism going forward. And this is something we as a community as a whole have to support because if we truly want to maintain the character of Hawaii and uh, rely on the funding that the tourism can bring, we've got to do a better job managing it. So we need to support this going forward. And I know Doug and I've had numerous conversations about this, how we can take this forward better. But again, we're just in the, the stages right now of that opening up. I can't have a talk, James, without talking about our budget. And um, as everyone knows, we had a initially 592 million budget. The, it was revised after the um, closer final numbers came in up to 609 million. We ended up with a 610 million budget. And I've said this before, um, I was very pleased with how this mayor approached his budgeting. It was very cautious and making sure that things are starting to opening up before we get too extravagant on our expenditures. I think we're gonna be in decent shape for our budget overall. And I don't see any glaring shortfalls per se right now, because I think it's been very cautious coming into this. That makes me happy. And I, I, I'm not concerned about what's gonna happen in the next fiscal year, or actually we started it today fiscal 21-22. So I think from that perspective, we're in good shape. Now coming back to all the projects, a lot has been sidelined for the last, well, year and a half, year and a half because of COVID. Previous to that, we were dealing with a volcano. So there's a lot of things that have been delayed and a lot of projects that I wish we could have gotten started on sooner. Uh, we've talked about this and uh, James, on the numerous different Zoom calls and different forums and different meetings we've had, um, some of the big concern and, and items that are um, on people's minds right now in and around our district. Number one, the Waikoloa Road, Mauka to Makai from the uh, Mamalo Highway down to Queen K. That is high up on the stiff list, but again, the funding is a little bit questionable because it ties into the federal funding that um, 
we don't have federal and state funding that is not exactly secured because of the economy. But I do know we're high on the, the list and we're just waiting on that one. Um, another thing that Waikoloa intersection, a lot of conversations going on around that. The good news for the Waikoloa intersection is we have that funding and that is still secured. The question is how are we moving forward with that? And there's been a lot of hype. We don't need to get into that conversation uh, between a traffic circle versus um, a traffic light. That is forthcoming in a different form. Um, concerning, uh, I know, well, th this is Waimea, um, the, this is a big district, but um, some other things going on in Waikoloa. Uh, one of the parks down there, they had a, a damaged slide and fortunately we have enough funding to get that taken care of very, very quickly. So um, we're gonna be able to get that fixed in one of the parks down there. Uh, another thing that, and you've heard me say this before, the, the Puakoa, Puako wastewater issue. It's my belief that our nearshore waters are the responsibility of the whole county. Whether we live right in that district, we are all enjoy the, the value of clean and pristine waters. Right now, ongoing with Puako and the wastewater there, the funding was approved, and I think most of the people in this group know that, for the planning of the project going forward. If you recall that determination from um, the injection wells of Maui, that's kind of changed everything right now. And so exactly how we're gonna deal with wastewater going forward, that's the bigger question. Um, it's my firm belief that we're gonna to have to have better wastewater treatment. And I think going forward, we're gonna to have to partner up uh, and probably the, the nearest wastewater treatment there is uh, Mount Olani. And I think we need to be talking to them because we're going to have to be changing. I think we have to think outside the box. New wastewater treatment is very expensive. And with all of this, I'm very hopeful that coming out of Washington, D.C., some of the stimulus money we're going to be able to use for our infrastructure. Um, I do sit on the National Association of Counties Board of Directors. And obviously, this is probably one of the number one things we're discussing, all the infrastructure as it pertains to the um, availability for wastewater, roads, bridges, internet access, all of this is, again, kind of rebuilding the, the country as a whole. So I'm hopeful we're gonna be able to capture some of those dollars and channel them into our county and not have to go through the state because somehow the funds don't seem to make it to us um, as clear as if they just come directly to us. So with that, um, I think I've discussed enough, James. I mean, I can go on and on, so. <laughs> No, not a problem. Thank you, Councillor. We did have one question from one of our board members. Uh, Nancy, if you want to hop on and ask away. Sure. Thank you. Hey, Tim. How's it going, um, Nancy? Good, good. So something unique to the Big Island, I'm pretty sure, and um, something that seems to me is becoming a bit of an issue is goats. Mm -hmm. what, what do you see the county potentially doing to manage the goat population? The, the short answer is it's not a county issue, it's truly a state issue. Um, I've talked to the state and there's no plans in going forward with that. So um, being my typical pesky self, I move on and I started talking to the feds. I've been in contact with um, Congressman Kaikahele's office to discuss this. And we have some issues as it pertains to agriculture and grazing. And the goats, you know, this population, anybody who grew up here on the islands, when I was a kid, we had goats, but not like we have today. Now you drive to Kona and you'll see 20 or 30 or 40 every time, which is was never like this before. We're gonna to have to manage this population. And now that we're coming out of the pandemic, we can start focusing back on things that are impacting our environment. Goats play a horrific role as far as denuding the grasslands. So um, a few animals, okay, but the too many is, too many and I'm trying to focus on that coming from the agriculture standpoint working with a, a rancher down in South Kona and seeing if we can move the needle and, and make some changes on that. Awesome thank you. Thank you for that question Nancy and Councillor we'll keep you on for a little bit and uh, kind of yep. we'll pivot to another part of agriculture if you don't mind and we're going to welcome in our our final guest this evening and we're grateful to have and be joined by um Two, two women here working in the fields, uh, kind of managing our, our grazing uh, acreage and our lands here on Hawaii Island and across the state, I imagine as well. But so for this final uh, portion of tonight's agenda, we're eager 
We're also a little bit nervous to learn about the threat of a relatively new invasive species that's been affecting us and has tremendous potential to impact our agricultural lands. So we're grateful to be joined by two of the specialists from the USDA, Natural Resource Conservation Service. We have our state grazing lands, lands management specialist, Carolyn Wong, and range technician, Elena Dosamantes, to kind of enlighten us about the two-line spittle bug. So mahalo, Carolyn and Elena, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you so much for having us. Um, I'm very interested in this goat conversation that just got started as well. And uh, Tim, you know me, um, I love to talk story and I've been trying to pitch um, our, our rangeland health manage, uh, monitoring protocol to the state uh, DLNR boys here in Waimea. Um, and then COVID kind of disrupted the tentative meetings that we had scheduled and whatnot. So keep me in mind as that comes along, um, it's a huge issue. And if we think it's big now, oh honey, just wait two years because those goats will be three times as many. So I don't know what it's gonna take before we I'll move. Call, I'll but, call you, Carolyn, I'll call you. Great, great. all right. Um, all right, let me share my screen. Okay. All right. So thank you so much. Um, thank you, James, for that introduction. Uh, yes, I am Carolyn Wong. I'm the state grazing land or rangeland management specialist. And I am joined uh, this evening by Elena Dosamantes. Um, <clears throat> uh, Elena and I have been working together uh, for the last 18 months via a unique partnership that we formed, um, NRCS formed uh, with the Kohala Center. And together we've been working to um, do what we can to address issues relating to conservation on Hawaii's grazing lands. One of our big focuses have been the two-line spittle bug and the impact that it's been having to our landscape. Um, as we, <clears throat> before we get into our slides, we've worked with others in the two-line spittle bug task force, as well as some of the rent ranchers that have been impacted and we've put together a short video to help raise awareness that we would like to share with you now. It's almost as good as taking you out there to see the impacts firsthand. And let me just make sure that um, I've shared my sound. Uh, one moment, please. Share sound. Okay, good. All right. James, can you give me a heads up if you can see my video? Thumbs up. Okay, super. Here it comes. Thank you. It's just queuing up right now. Okay, it uh, looks like it's not loading entirely. Um, I think there's a problem here on my end, one moment. Zoom has not been very friendly to me lately, so please bear with me, thank you. No problem. Okay. Uh, trying one more time. Raise awareness for the general public, for ranchers, for um, agency leaders and lawmakers of the significance of the two-line spittle bug and the impact that it's going to have to Hawaii's agriculture and livestock industries. My heart really sank and I realized that this is going to change our lives forever. One of the most saddest things is of Malka when we would go up there and we would sit, see a pasture hit. It looks like someone rounded up the grass and you would walk through the grass that's about this high and you would kick it and it would just, 
it would just fly in the air and it, it's like someone rounded up your whole pasture. What really struck me was the fact that you could swipe your hand over the forage and it was dead all the way to the roots. All of a sudden my eyes opened to the extent of what was going on because as the insect pest moved into the higher elevations, we started seeing this classic dieback. Everyone thinks they can battle it, but when it comes to you, there's no way you can battle it. These bugs, they fly. I've seen them fly far. It's very hard to control, and it's very unrealistic to go and spray pesticide on these little tiny bugs because they're a little nymph that grows inside of the spit mass, and it's so hard to penetrate that spit mass that you cannot poison this thing. My gut tells me, and with the experts on it, that it's kind of a, it's not if, it's when it gets here. If it starts spreading statewide, you know, the whole industry is uh, going to have some issues. You're talking about a, a huge loss of production. This bug can bring devastation to, to our lifestyle. We've cut back our herd 50% due to the spittle bug, and we're still decreasing our herd. We're just culling all our cows. It's due to the loss of grass and the increase of weeds, and it's looking like we're still going to have to keep decreasing for a few more years until we get this problem over with. And right now we're nowhere near stopping this thing. It's it's moving at about 35,000 acres a year. I mean, when it gets into an area, like I said, right now it's catastrophic. If it gets into this Waimea Plain, they control 65% of the cattle in the state. It would be economically devastating if it got here. The cattle industry in the state would just almost evaporate because of that and God forbid it gets to one of the other islands. The type of help that the ranch would need, I think, is, is awareness in the community, first of all. You know, I think the research is extremely critical. It's got to continue. Um, but I also think that, you know, this is not a rancher problem. This is a statewide problem. This is the state's problem. So the research that the university is doing right now needs to continue to be funded extensively to back up the money that has been put out on the land. Funding to help ranchers buy seed, I think, is going to be the most important thing that we could ask the uh, agencies that do assist ranchers here. Biosecurity is the number one issue for conservation, for farmers, for ranchers, for people who just like being outside. If we don't have good biosecurity, we're going to lose it all. If we don't improve our biosecurity, the future of agriculture in Hawaii gets bleaker and bleaker every day. Okay. Big thank you to all the supporters that helped us make that video. Um, back to the slideshow. Okay. We should be back on my slide now. James, can you give me a thumbs up? Okay, super. Thank you. Um, thanks so much for um, also giving us the time to share that video with you. Um, it's kind of short and sweet, really cuts to the cuts to the chase and uh, makes a very strong um, message. And I like it that you could hear directly from some of the ranchers that are impacted and that are dealing with this. That video is available on Vimeo. It's publicly available. Um, if you just look up the Nakula Hawaii uh, Vimeo page, you'll find it there. The link is shown on the screen. I'm also happy to share that link with the association leaders if you'd like um, for, for you to share as, as you see fit. Okay, so to begin, yes, uh, the two-line spittlebug is a new invasive species first discovered in 2016 in Kona. Since then, it has spread and at last estimate in 2020, it has um, been found to be impacting uh, over 176,000 acres in West Hawaii. We've been seeing it increase by about 35,000 acres per year. And as far as we know, uh, right now, the closest edge of the impacted areas to Waimea is about 10 and a half miles from the edge of the Waikiki pastures. So the two-line spittlebug has a lot of impact on our surroundings. Um, one of the, the, it has impacts on agriculture, land, landscapes, food, culture and community and the environment. So first let's talk about agriculture. Um, the two-line spittlebug can, kills a lot, a wide variety of grasses. Some of these are kikuyu grass and pingola grass. These two grasses alone support 70% of the cattle in Hawaii. Um, 
Life, livestock industry cannot afford to lose these process. So when the two-line spill bug arrives, um, it, trans it, it kills all the grass and then all of that is tra transformed to weed. So as you can see in this picture on the left, um, that was, I think when the spill bug had barely gotten there, it was not there yet, it was not showing, the damage was not showing yet. And then on the right, you can see the effects of the two-line spill bug being there. Um, these are all weeds. Um, they're very hard to walk through. There, it's, it's all none of it is good for for cattle, for other wildlife, and so on. So this is pretty much what happens when the two line spill bug gets there. Here are some other pictures. 2015, it was still um, grass that, that the cattle could eat, that wildlife could eat, that you could walk through with no problem. Then 2019, it's all weeds. Um, 2020, it's it's even worse, the weeds are thriving. They're all green, they're all happy to be there. Yeah, yeah, what we're noticing um, as the grass dies back, we see the first wave of weeds are um, kind of short-lived, herbaceous, forbs, um, forb types of weeds. And they're, they're, they're not great um, because they're not edible, but they're a little easier to manage. Um, as time goes by, those weeds give way to a worse wave of weeds where we get things that are much more serious and formidable and more difficult to manage. Weeds such as pomacani, lantana, guava, blackberry. Uh, these weeds become much more restrictive and um, in, in access um, as well as um, longer lived, deeper rooted and much, much more difficult to manage. So what happens when the two line spill bug gets to a ranch? Usually ranchers are having to reduce their herds by about 50%, as you heard in the video. Um, average loss of production is about $133 per acre affected by the spittle bug. That's a lot of money. Um, when you begin to talk about recovery, what will it take to get that um, spittle bug slash weed infested land back to what it used to be? We're looking at about $500 per acre. And that's, that's money, but time, um, it would take about 10 years. Uh, the people are estimating they would take about 10 years to have the pastures go back to what they used to be. Or something similar, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, um, with the two-line spittle bug, we, we don't expect it to go away. Um, it's been here for several years and I would love to be wrong, but all signs are indicating that this pest is, um, is here to stay. And, and unfortunately is, is impact increasing its range um, every day. Um, so the impacts are surely felt by the ranching community, but um, let us not think that they're gonna be the only ones that feel it. Many of us benefit from these landscapes. As these open grasslands become invaded, the rolling hills and beautiful vistas, many of us hold dear will almost certainly change. And some, unfortunately may disappear. Outdoor enthusiasts that enjoy hiking, hunting, photography, and the like may find those activities limited uh, as inhospitable plant communities take over. The impacts to our food systems um, are also going to be felt by the two-line spittle bug. Less grass means less cows, means less beef. Our local protein is heavily reliant on the livestock industry. Needless to say, this industry is very important to Hawaii's food security. One lesson COVID taught us is just how vulnerable we are out here to disruptions in the system that we live in today. I thought it very um, serendipitous, uh, the shares that, the things that you all were sharing earlier in the meeting with the food pantries and the way that the different, you know, parts of the community have been coming together while the livestock industry was featured there so much. And I just was like, wow, it was actually really good timing um, to share on some of this stuff. Um, if the industry goes, you know, we're going to feel it in our communities also as jobs go, which will impact our local economies. Our Paniolo heritage is alive and well today because it is a livelihood in our communities. These are people's bread and butter. Makahana ka ike, we say. And if the work goes, so goes the ike, so goes the knowledge, so goes the skills. If the industry suffers, our local community food security systems will also suffer. And beyond the impacts to just our agricultural lands and our agricultural productivity, two-line spittle bug impacts are also being seen in other aspects of our environment. Grasses are dying back in the forest. 
And when they die back in that forest understory, it gives way to other worse invasive species, such as Coster's curse in this picture in Guava. As the plant communities change, our watershed function will also change. We don't even know all of the ways that that's gonna add up, but we do know that it, it, is, it is changing, especially as we lose sediment runoff that in turn usually damages our coral reefs. So what is being done right now to fight back this, this cut? So first let's talk about the research that's being done. Um, University of Hawaii is leading a, a research project on the chewing spittle bugs. They're doing many things. Um, some of these things are monthly monitoring. So every month they go out to sites that are being affected by the Tulane spittle bugs. Um, and they're running these transects where they are able to see how um, PLSB po populations are, how many are now, how many we have now, how many we have in the next month and so on. The life stages of the Tulane spittle bug at the time that they're, they're observing them. And they're also observing the changes in plant communities. Many of the pictures that we have been showing you of the before and after are um, pictures that they have taken for their study. Something else that is being done is uh, development of fact sheets and bulletins to inform people of uh, what the Tulane spittle bug is and how you can deal with it and prevent uh, moving it. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And they're also determining the thresholds of economic damage. Uh, many of these numbers that we showed you also come from their research. Um, they're also looking at host plants and seeing like uh, what plants can resist the spittle bug, which ones can't, and then pesticide, um, trying pesticides, see if there's anything that's a viable option to fight back. And then <laughs> on our side, uh, NRCS has some field plantings. We have field plantings where we're looking at various things. So we're looking at um, how you can suppress these undesirable weeds that came up after the two-line spittle bug got to, some, to these places. Then we're also planting uh, resistant grasses, uh, grasses that have been said to be able to survive the two-line spittle bug. And besides planting them, we're also assessing different methods, different techniques on, on planting these grasses. We're also looking at increasing forage diversity um, in places that are still, still don't have the Tulane spittle bug, but, but that are threatened. Um, as you saw in the graph, the Tulane spittle bug is expanding. And then we're also developing a low cost light trap um, to be able to detect the Tulane spittle bug before you can see the damage because the damage is once it's totally infested. We're working on some education and outreach. Uh, we're doing what we can to get the word out and answer questions and so on. And we're also working with the local field offices, the, your local NRCS field office, to make sure that uh, we're able to help these ranchers that are being affected. On the side of outreach, um, as you saw the video at the beginning of our presentation, that is one of the things that we're working on. We're working on these informational videos. That's one of, I think, three. We already are working on the second one. We're also trying to distribute this card that you see on the right. You might have already seen it at some point um, around the island. And if you haven't, you can find it at, our, at your local NRCS field office or at the UH extension office. We're also working on presentations with different community groups, um, like right here. <laughs> we also want to increase our presence on social media so that, again, the word has to get out um, some of these sites that you can follow on social media where we'll be um, reporting about on the Tulane Spittle Bug are BISC, Hawaii Cattlemen's uh, Council, and Nakula, Hawaii. And then there's two really cool things that are coming your way. Um, the UH is working on developing a Tulane Spittle Bug app for smartphones, and we are working on putting together a website where we can host all of this information such as videos and any other graphs that we have shown you in pictures. Yeah. Yeah, and speaking of COVID pivots, um, you know, this research has been going on for years and uh, or for a couple of years now. And um, part of the plan was to do outreach workshops and things. And obviously COVID uh, put a damper on a lot of that. And one of the pivots that we made was to switch to multimedia formats. And um, we were grateful to work with some very talented uh, videographers and video editors, and uh, they're helping us uh, put it together um, in ways that are easily shared, uh, whether we have to social distance or not. 
and obviously social media um, is continues to be an important outlet uh, for information. Finally, um, there's the ranchers are the ones that are uh, and, you know, in the signing line, they're the ones that have to act and the ones that are definitely acting. So how is this happening? Mainly they're collaborating with UH, they're collaborating with us. Um, they're helping us with these field plantings that we just mentioned. So whenever we plant something, it's on their land. They're the ones that do most of the work. They're doing everything they can to make this, uh, these tests this successful. Um, they're also trying out new forage species, the ones that we talked that might be resistant to the spittle bug and those that we know that are resistant to the spittle bug. And finally, they're also going to help us test these um, light traps. So the ones that already have the spittle bug are going to test them and see if it will catch the spittle bug so that then we can use them in uh, those ranches that do not have them or do, we don't know if they have them yet. And that way we can find out. They're also taking environmental action through their work. They are reducing their herd size. Um, as the grass goes, they, they don't just leave their cattle there until everything's gone. They're definitely working on making sure that they make the best decisions for the environment and for their cattle. They're reallocating cattle. There's some that have been able to move to their cattle somewhere else. And they're doing other management, um, using other management methods to make sure that they don't harm the environment. Yeah, as uh, you know, many of us already know, ranchers are some of the best land stewards. Um, the ranchers that we've been working with, um, this is a such a devastating, really a disaster uh, that's that's hitting them. But they really um, pulled up their bootstraps and are just bound and determined. They're such a tenacious bunch uh, to find solutions, and we're really fortunate to to work with them. And, and we're just really fortunate to have them as as people in our community. Um, so I just want to I, I can't give enough uh, recognition and kudos to the people that are on the front line that are dealing with this. Um, Kaua Wall, who's in that picture, she was all, she was one of the first ranchers to agree to be interviewed, and um, it was it, it's been a great pleasure to work with her. And she's a shining example of uh, someone with a lot of grit and who's going to work hard to find a solution. So finally, what can you do? <clears throat> there are many things that the community can do to help with this problem. First of all, be alert. Learn how to recognize the bug and um, identify it if you if you see it in a place particularly um, outside of the Kona area. Uh, you should know that the bug has two main life stages. There are nymphs, which are the immature stages that are found in the spittle mass, and then there are, there are the adults. The spittle masses of the two-line spittle bug are almost always at the ground level. You know, some of us might be familiar with other spittle bugs that, that form their spittle masses up higher on a plant. They're, um, that there is another type of spittle bug, the metal spittle bug that has been here for a really long time and is not that damaging. Um, that's not the one that is of concern. The two line spittle bug is in a spittle mass as an immature nymph at the ground level. Um, they have a brown head, a, cre a yellow cream colored body, red eyes and two pink lines on the sides of their abdomen. You can kind of see it good in that picture. The adult are also very conspicuous. They're about the size of your pinky nail they're all black with two reddish orange lines that go across their wings. They also have red eyes, red legs, and a red abdomen under their wings. And you'll find that these bugs are most active during the late spring through fall. Over the winter, they go into diapause and you really don't see very much of them, but their numbers start to climb in the spring. Be alert, Recognize. also learn how to recognize the damage. Be on the lookout for patches of dead grass that cannot be explained by other environmental factors. You can see these patches of dead grass are among uh, beautiful green lush pastures. So there's something else going on there. This is not dead grass due to drought. Patches are often small at first and they uh, pretty quickly become invaded with weeds. And when you see the dead grass, it'll look like it's been injured as if by herbicide. If you find a two-line spittle bug, especially outside the Kona area, please report it. We're partnered with 643 Pest. They're prepared to take reports and they will get them processed and sent to the proper authorities to follow up on. If you see strange dead patches of pasture, report that too. Uh, we're following up on reports of, of strange, um, unexplainable dead patches of pasture, just in case that is where uh, we might have a new two-line spittle bug outbreak. And if you're not sure, um, if you're not 100% sure that what you're seeing is a spill bug, but you think it is, um, report it report and it anyway. we will help you. Yes. Another thing that we can all do is to be careful. 
The spittle bug is habitat is in the soil. So do not move sod or potted plants out of the Kona area as much as possible. Do not bring soil or compost out of the Kona area. The bugs lay its eggs in the soil and under plant litter. And if we're moving these things around, we are gonna increase our likelihood of possibly moving the two-line spittle bug into a new area. And if you're working or playing outdoors in areas with two-line spittle bug, be aware that these, two, these adults are small and they hop around. Here you can see one got onto my bucket when we're in the field. So be careful to clean out your clothes, clean out your gear, watch your tools, Clean out your vehicles, keep your doors and windows closed when you're in the grassy areas in Kona. We've had these, these bugs fly all over our cars. Um, we're careful to, to disinfect and not disinfect, that's the wrong word, mm -hmm. um, to, to power wash or clean our vehicles before we leave Kona, particularly during the summer months. Um, we don't ever wanna be responsible for bringing a hitchhiker and into a new area. We have to be really careful. They are expert hitchhikers. Um, they wear boots and they have gotten in on two occasions. Good thing I always check my the inside of my boots and just like clean them out, but just be aware that they are they're really good at it. Yeah, the, the likelihood is not ext extremely high, but the risk is if they get into these new, new areas, it's it just makes these problems that much worse. We need a little more time to develop solutions. Finally, be an ally. Help us spread the word. Um, we have rack cards available at the NRCS and UH Extension offices across the state. Uh, please help us share the videos and the website. Um, please uh, do what you can to support funding for research and mitigation efforts. Uh, efforts and you know any chance you get, elevate the need for better, better biosecurity for the state of Hawaii. And finally, um, be supportive. Ranchers that are impacted by this are under significant stress and strain. It's, it means a lot when you can just be understanding and supportive. Uh, consider donating your time as a volunteer to the task force to Big Island Invasive Species Committee or at NRCS. And finally, the Hawaii Rangeland Stewardship Foundation is set up to, and prepared to receive any donations if anyone might want to make uh, to support the work that's being done. Um, you can access them through the Hawaii Rangeland Stewardship um, website. And that's all we have. Unless there's time for questions, thank you all very much for the opportunity to share um, on this platform. We really appreciate it. and. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions if there's time. Mahalo, Carolyn. Um, thank you so much. That's a lot of information there. Um, I know we're a little short on time, um, but if Mike and Nancy, if you wanted to ask a couple of questions, you're welcome to jump in here and ask Elena and Carolyn um, some of these community questions that you might have. Sure. Uh, this is Mike. I'll go first. Um, for the two-line spittle bug, is there two questions? Is there a competitive um uh predator out there for the bugs one and then two can you describe again uh the zone the impact zone right now um you know i just i think you mentioned waikiki ranch um so i work up at pta and we've got natural resource folks that do exactly what you're describing and i'm interested to, to concern with the massive property that's under the military um the concerns there in terms of the dryland forest area and the like? Yes, thank you, great questions. The main areas that are threatened are everywhere that have sod forming pastures. So Waikiki, all of Waimea, much of Kohala, uh, we all, it's, it's pretty much all Kikuyu grass pasture. So everywhere that there's this sod type of pasture, that's the ideal habitat for the spittle bug. They do need a certain amount of moisture. Um, and so where we're finding the impacts are most severe, in Kona are in the mid to high elevation pastures where the Kikuyu grass starts to kick in and where we have rainfall of probably 50 inches on up. Um, and then you asked if there's anything that eats them that, that might be a natural biocontrol. You know, we've had some anecdotal reports that some of the crops of turkeys and cattle egrets, they've been finding some, some two-line spittle bug in their crop and that they are consuming them. Unfortunately, they're not expected to put enough pressure on them to actually keep their numbers in check. Um, there's oodles of game birds in uh, the upper areas of Kona and the damage is still being seen and it's still extreme. Great questions. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Carolyn, Elena. Um, what I guess a question I had was, where, where do these originate from? Where did the two-line spittle bug originate from? It's native to the Southeastern United States. Okay. Thank you. 
Yeah, there, there's some other questions that are very similar that are coming online too about natural predators. So we've covered that, um, really targeting our pasture grasslands. Any, any impact on our, our production crops of produce or any sort of uh, vegetables, fruit crops, anything like that? Um, you know, some of the Kona coffee farmers did report that they started to notice their usually between their rows of coffee where they had grass, the grasses were, were getting lost and they were having higher um, numbers of weeds or the grass community was just changing. Um, so from that aspect, the, the two-line spittle bug is definitely a, favors grass. So they're affecting grass the most. Um, we'll likely also see impacts to our other sod, other landscape industries. Um, our golf courses are likely gonna be impacted. In fact, two-line spittle bug is, is very well known for the impact that they have to sod. Um, and there's tons of research or information available um, from managing it from a sod perspective. Unfortunately, uh, the budgets that support golf courses and other things are usually not, not quite the same when you're a rancher. So a lot That's of other beautiful. solutions that are out there um, are, are more geared towards smaller landscape level solutions. Um, there's really not a really good chemical solution for landscape level solutions at the scale that we're talking about for ranching. Sorry, Auntie Nancy, do you have a question? I, I just wanted to commend you guys. That was a great presentation and the video is uh, really good as well. And I'd love it if you can share that with James, so that he can give it to the board of directors and we can all share it out to our groups to make sure we get the word out. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, we just launched uh, our longer version. We have a 26 minute, more of a documentary style. It's gonna go into more detail, surely answer many more questions. It just got live on the Big Island Invasive Species Committee's uh, YouTube channel and the press release is coming out that's also going to announce it and make it available, so. I'll also make sure you have the link to that one. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's wonderful. I, I do have one last question here actually, and it's really kind of looking down the road. Um, do we have to consider new feed crops and grasslands for our, for our pastures? Is that something that we need to take action on and really think about for future planning? Absolutely. For our landscapes that are reliant right now on Kikuyu grass, um, it's looking like that's the only long-term viable solution is to help to transition those landscapes over to another type of grass that is, that is resistant to two-line spittlebug damage. That is where a majority, a, a very large part of our focus in research is aiming at because it's the most sustainable solution that we really see before us. The two-line spittlebug or, or spittlebugs are also really damaging in South America. And that's um, similarly, that's the only viable solution that they've found as well, which was to develop and transition pastures to, to forage types that do not uh, succumb to the two-line spittle bug damage. And we also want to make sure that it's not just one type of grass. We want to make sure that we have a diversity so that if anything kind of similar happens again, we have, when you have a diversity of grasses, that's your insurance. Mm -hmm. So we're mm -hmm. definitely working on that. We're, we're making field plantings. We're seeing how it grows in the land here in Hawaii. It's different to have it potted, like planted somewhere else or in a potted, uh, in a pot. Um, so we're trying it out in the field to make sure that it's a viable solution. Yes, diverse pastures are definitely more resilient. Wonderful. Well, I really appreciate, and we really appreciate all the work that you're doing, um, getting the word out there, the outreach, and all the field work as well. Elena, Carolyn, thank you so much for this information and educating us and uh, sharing this out there. Thank you so much. It's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be happy to provide updates as they're available. That'd be great. And uh, we will distribute and disseminate the video and really share this information. And it's, it's really something that the community needs to know about and kind of the next, uh, next project, the next homework we have. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, um, amazing and, and troubling at the same time too. So before we close tonight's meeting, I just wanna say a couple words. Um, mahalo nui to all of our presenters this evening for joining us, for taking the time to update our viewers and the community and really to helping lead a lot of the effort across, across the community and across the island. Um, thank you all to the viewers for joining us on the live stream this evening. Uh, you're welcome to revisit, rewatch this recording up on our Facebook page and it'll also be up on our YouTube channel a little later this weekend. And of course, have a safe holiday weekend, everyone. Please be mindful and be safe. And on behalf of the Waimea Community Association Board, I wish you good health, be well, aloha.